Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, this is such an amazing opportunity on the occasion of Vasudev's exhibition that we've been able to put together a panel of artists coming from very different disciplines and forms in the arts to talk about artistic connections. At the very beginning, I would like to thank the NGMA, their outreach program, for enabling this to happen today. In an interview some years ago, Vasudev spoke about how music has been a space of deep exploration for him. He was listening to musical compositions by various musicians called soundscapes. Round about the same time that his partner, Amal Joseph, was introducing him to various activists who come from very different parts of India fighting very different causes. He listened to the music as he met these different people struggling in the movements for environment, human rights, women's issues. And out of this meditation, this connection of ideas and forms came a new yet unexplored series of his work that he titled Earthscapes and Humanscapes. The arts is many universes of ideas, expressions, reflections, interventions, experiences and critiques, a way of thinking and making sense of the world that we live in, both in life and beyond it. A journey to understand our yesterdays, to interrogate our todays, and to possibly imagine the kind of collective futures that we can have in our tomorrows. In this exploration, who does the artist travel with? Who does the artist make his or her co-journey person in those worlds of ideas and debates, questions and choices? Other artists in the same discipline, artists from other disciplines who work responding to different senses, who work through different mediums, methods and techniques, thinkers from worlds of philosophy, sociology, economics and science, or activists who take to the streets to make this a more human and just world. There was in the 70s the coffee house in Kolkata which saw fierce debates among poets and artists, theaterwalas and filmmakers on the latest exhibition of the students of the Academy of Fine Arts or on the latest film that was premiered. In 1982, the Journal of Arts and Ideas was first published when practitioners and scholars from the left came together to build a platform in order to pursue their quest towards finding the Indian modern the similarities and divergences of their intellectual challenges and the connections in their work help them to explore new perspectives in looking into Indian modernity. Vivan Sundaram, Romi Kosla, Gita Kapoor, Sadanan Menon, Chandra Lekha, G.P. Desh Pandey, Sarit Mirza were only some of the eminent names in that group. Do these connections that artists make with each other and with the thinkers and practitioners of other worlds, open new worlds for them, liberate the artist to explore new frontiers to cartograph? Do they make the artist reflect and rethink on their work that they have already done and look for new ways to imagine their next set of work? Do they enable conversations that wouldn't have ha happened otherwise about lives and worlds that they cannot venture alone into? through their own disciplines only. Hope these are some of the questions that our session might look at addressing today. And I'm delighted as the moderator of this session to have with us Prakash Velavadi from the world of theater and film. <laughs> Neeti Desai from the world of dance and design. from the world of music and theatre. Amandeep Sandhu from the world of literature. Gautam Somni from the world of film. And Ravi Hashi from the world of visual arts. 
My name is Arun Nandi and I work with a foundation called India Foundation for the Arts and I'll be moderating your session today. We hope today we'll be able to share different points of views and reflections on what artistic connections have meant for your practices, for the different practices that you represent. Starting off with stories, I was just wondering if um, some of you would like to share uh, moments of truth that have happened for you when encountering another artist's work, either in your discipline or in any other discipline, and what that perhaps made you feel excited, confused, disagreeing, um, liberated, something else. And while you felt this, what, what did this artistic connection mean for you in your own work? You know, when I think of artistic connections, for me, it's been a very, very personal experience and journey. The fact that I'm dancing today is because of design. I originally trained as a designer, and as I was exploring design very, very early on, I had this intense dissatisfaction with the form. And I felt that everything that I'm creating is outside me. I definitely want to engage with design, but I want to internalize design. And I said, how do I internalize design? So I was confused and the only things that kind of came, the words that came to me that I want to design with my body and I want to design through my body. And how do I do that? And it just occurred to me that I think I just need to dance. And my journey into dance really began there, that you know, to be able to engage with visuals, to be able to engage with aesthetics through the body and in the body, dance is an idiom. And that's when the beginning of a connection happened. And that connection actually has stayed with me all through and it kind of facilitates the two disciplines that I engage with. I am a designer and I am a dancer. When I, when I dance, actually I feel I'm visualizing and designing in space. And when I design, I feel that can I make the space dance? And so it's just extremely personal, but for me they are just two dimensions that I kind of flow with. And yeah, that's the beginning of one of my artistic connections. You know, I studied to be a mechanical engineer. This was my dream. And it was, I never imagined that uh, I would uh, spend so many years uh, doing plays and being involved with a community like this. And to me, the idea of artistic uh, connections, I'm saying I'm limiting it to, so I'm going to borrow from Ramanujan. To an interior landscape, you know, how one kind of thing influences the other. See, the, the main thing that I would like to say here, what, what was, was shocking to me about what is the idea of the artistic, or what is the aesthetic, for instance. I was always ashamed of, say, colors in South Indian cinema. You know, the, uh, say, South Indian movie stars would wear yellow colored bell bottoms. And you know, I I went to I went to college and when I was a teenager, everybody would make fun of uh, South Indian accent and uh, the way they speak. And I believed this for a long time. And you know, I felt some internal shame because some of them were my heroes. I really liked. So I felt really like, intimidated by the discourse uh, measurement of what is artistic. And for instance, when I was a teenager, I liked Billy Wilder films. I was a big fan of his. And in the, in the, imagine in the 70s, you know, when there was, there was an explosion of artistic, personal cinema and socially conscious cinema, you, you couldn't go out and say, I, this is the kind of film you like, right? But I, like now I have the courage to say I like Die Hard, but that time I, I felt intimidated. Till, you know, one day, for instance, I saw uh, uh, Satyajit Rai receiving Oscars, you know, because it was not well, he couldn't grab into the cell, it was given to him. It came on Durdarshan, and they asked him this question, you know, what inspired him to make films? And he said, you know, he loved Billy Wilder, he said. 
And then I thought, I wish I had the courage just to be myself. And you know, that kind of thing can influence you. The first time I heard, say, Sufi music, I realized that just like rock musicians of a particular era, they don't care if their voice cracks, you know, in, in the passion of singing. They don't care if they're not pretty, for instance. And you know, it, it, you begin, you can interrogate your own ideas of what is supposed to be like final or, you know. And I stopped being ashamed of the colors uh, that, uh, that you see in, in, in Indian life. And I think for, for someone like me, I can be truthful only if I'm completely Indian, man, because that's the only thing I know. So I say that one kind of thing can influence how you think about others. I no longer feel ashamed to see a jatri, uh, to see a procession, uh, you know, to see flowers being uh, thrown. My ideal notions of what is pretty has changed dramatically from as, as, as a disconnected a thing as Sufi music or rock music to, you know, how a stage should be designed, for instance, yeah. Uh, my name is Abhi and I consider myself a singer-songwriter and a musician. So for a long time, I really didn't, I had no way of uh, making things, I'd knowing whether I, how well I was doing, I just did it. And people would say, oh, I like this song, I don't like this song. I was playing with a band. So my typical process was uh, there would be something that I would be doing, uh, a line would come up and then maybe a chorus, a couple of verses, and then I take it straight to the band and have the band help me finish the song. Uh, and then I started working with um, people who were uh, doing theatre, some were making film. Uh, I see Sushma in the audience, she gave me one of my first gigs uh, making music for one of her movies. Um, so that was a really interesting experience for me because I was engaging with people who were trying to tell stories uh, in their own ways and I, I was being asked to make music around those stories and I had to get into their words. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm representing films and uh, of course films uh, have connections with all the other arts, uh, I suppose. Uh, but uh, I'm going to speak from my personal experience as a documentary filmmaker. And, um, and while speaking of connections, we also need to speak of the hierarchy of the arts. And, and over there we find that documentary films are at the bottom of the heap, unfortunately. Um, uh, and, you know, often uh, not recognized as an art form at all, um, even by, say, this institution. Um, <laughs> because we try getting space, we try getting this hall uh, to screen films once a month, um, and we were met with a kind of bureaucratic stubbornness about uh, uh, what constitutes um, something that good art or something. I mean, we were allowed to, we were told that we can screen films that were about art, but not uh, otherwise. So through most of my uh, filmmaking career, I think I've drawn more inspiration from anthropology or visual anthropology. Um, and, and I think I came to that through, uh, through uh, observational cinema, which I became uh, fascinated by in the 90s. Uh, and this, is, uh, this cinema dates back to, say, 60s, 70s. And originated in the US mostly, but in a different kind in France, uh, a more exciting kind I say in France, but I at that time was more fascinated by the, the US, uh, it was called direct cinema, or by many people it was called direct cinema, which is just kind of observational, and, but it followed the rules of fiction and the way in which you edit it together. Um, so from, but you know, many anthropologists were also fascinated by this kind of cinema. Uh, and essentially it became possible because of lightweight uh, sync sound cameras. Uh, before that it wasn't possible to just hang around and record people talking uh, in sync. So, so I, I, I find that there's uh, a lot of work from there that I relate to or that I, uh, I enjoy watching. And uh, to me it was like a breath of fresh air uh, at that time because most of the, the dominant documentary film form in India was uh, was more the political documentary, which is important, no doubt, but, uh, but you know, somehow the kind of form, the aesthetic that I seem to want to use was uh, closer to this, uh, um, to a more observational style. Um, and uh, well, I'll actually show you a small clip uh, in a bit, but, uh, uh, but just to mention one connection, I should mention at least one connection with one of the other art forms that's so closely related to film, which is uh, photography. But there's a 
Kotram uh, Besson, uh, only Katya Besson, uh, about his work, his approach to his uh, photography. He says, uh, um, you approach on tiptoe, uh, even still life. So that sort of really uh, 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 resonates with, uh, I think, this kind of uh, cinema. Um, so maybe I can show a little clip. Yeah. which is subtitled in English. It's a three-minute clip on YouTube, you can watch it. It's like a reverse ethnography of this uh, person from Algeria who comes to the streets of Paris and he uh, accosts all these white uh, Parisians and, uh, and he uh, has this measuring instrument. It's like a I don't know, protractor kind of thing. It's quite a large thing. And he stops them in the streets and goes around measuring their uh, head, the circumference, and their well, girth and, uh, and it's really quite funny. And, he, and, he, and increasingly, it becomes more and more intrusive. And people ask him, "Why are you doing this?" He says, "It's always for a, it's for a program on TV." And, and then he keeps writing down the figures. And then his final conclusion is, "Paris is a very happy place." When I received your email, I was a little overwhelmed that I've been asked to come here to talk about artistic connections and. And Arundhati said to me, first of all, a term like artist itself is a little overwhelming for me. A uh, writer, yes, but I'm actually a writer only because I want to make meaning. And I, I inherited a meaningless world because in a dysfunctional family. And in my adolescence, I entered a world which was again dysfunctional because it was Punjab in the militancy years. And Bangalore is really a sanctuary for me where I can sit back and I can look at things and hope to articulate them. But forever it has been, my concern has been that there is a personal pain, of course, but does it have a universal resonance also? Does it, how do I express it to the world in which everybody can relate to it? And there is one, The response I, I felt upon seeing a particular painting which has sort of laid the framework of whatever I'm trying to do. And this painting was Mustaf Klimt's Tree of Life in which there is a black bird of doubt. And in our Indian context, it can also be seen as a serpent and a rope, you know, the aspect of fear. And all I'm trying to do is probe my fear, to try to understand. And there is this one line I have repeated in both my books, and it is also occurring in the two other books that I'm writing. I'll read it out to you. Towards the end of the book, I say, Mama, Baba, and I suffered another disease, the disease of prejudice that colors your world and gnaws under the skin. It settles like the black bird of mistrust in the tree of knowledge and pecks away at experience. The disease flows between partners and corrupts a deeper view of events and people. Who you are is overshadowed by how you are perceived by one another, controlled and distorted by expectations of how we ought to be. The only person who can overcome it and its symptoms is the victim himself. Some conquer the bird of doubt and defy its pecking. Many do not. And this idea comes in my second book also in which there is an adolescent whose loyalties are split in the year 1984, which for my community was a watershed year in this country's history. And this young boy is studying in a military school and um, suddenly Operation Blue Star happens and he wonders who is he first? Second, he knows who he might be, but who is he first? Is he a Sikh or is he an Indian? And that question 
still haunts us. And there is this picture which a friend of mine took at Kanda Mahal for his uh, when the riots took place there. And I used it as the cover for the Punjabi translation of the book. It's there behind you. Yeah. While I lurk in the room where I sit and write the story, near my writing table there hangs a picture of a chair. A friend of mine who took it in Kanda Mahal, Odisha, after the riots a few years back. It is not a chair alone. Behind the chair is a broken wall of a church, painted a garish electric blue. Footwear is thrown near the chair, mostly not in pairs. The chair looks at me all the time. Its vision is so intense that I wilt under it and transform into one sitting on such a broken chair. While everything around me, I learn to become a witness. Thank you. Thanks, Aman. As how other forms, other than your own discipline, may sometimes make you look at your own work, even work that you've done earlier, differently. Yeah. See, I must tell you that you can be, you can always come across a moment of crisis and you have to respond to something new. But um, whether you're competent or not, you're asked a question and sometimes you talk. I used to read a column for um, some paper and uh, some commissioner of Bangalore City, he got all these walls painted with artistic stuff. Whatever. Okay, so, so I wrote a column, quite a nasty piece which ended with saying, you know, you experiment with these, put them in your bedroom, and then, then you know, you try it on the city. Which of course was not polite, and then they gave me the headline saying, the city gets an art attack. That was the headline. And then I met, one day, I, I met Jenny, she, I saw her somewhere here, Jenny Pinto. She said, uh, why, why do you think that is bad art? And I suddenly lost all confidence. How will I respond to that? And you'd never know if you're right sometimes. Thank you. Uh, connection with other art forms has been there from my childhood because I was uh, born and brought up in Majeshwaram, which is a very uh, old area in Bangalore. And we were in Sarat Kras. And across the road was the, the uh, field where the one could see Akshagana, one could see uh, theatre coming there, and then uh, uh, shadow puppetry, various kind of art forms. Then in the other roads, we were able to see orchestra in the Ganesha festival time. On the next road, we had Gandhi Sai Sangha where I could meet people like JP uh, Radharatnam who tell stories for us. Uh, just above that was Sitakala Parisha, which was the art school which I later joined and uh, uh, continued my art studies for. Then one road away was the uh, library, where one could access all the uh, books from various sources. So in a way, uh, in an indirect way, the, the area has shaped my interest in uh, various art forms and art. And the uh, very direct to this one, I want to bring one or two uh, instances. Two years ago, uh, I read a book by Milan Kundera, The Book is Called Immortality. And uh, at the time, of course, there is always a, a thread in my work about this idea of self-reflection, trying to understand who I am, what I am doing, uh, through my work, and how I am projecting myself, and so on and so forth. So in that uh, book of Vidhan uh, Kulvera, this uh, aging writer, Gaite, uh, uh, he meets a girl called Medina, and then uh, she wants to write about him. He wants to write his life story. But he doesn't want to get caught in her story. He wants to tell his story in his own terms, in his own way. Uh, so it's a very beautiful struggle between, uh, you know, uh, he trying to uh, uh, make his own space, but he's trying to uh, invade that space kind of thing. Then he got connected to how, as we artists, of course, even others do it, but we do it more methodically. We try to project ourselves in a certain way, you know, with a certain proper proportion. So we want to be remembered in a, in a particular way for posterity. Uh, so that uh, idea, the kind of insight I got from the book. Then uh, as I was already exploring this uh, theme, so I did a series of books, artist books which I do, where in each book I become somebody else. Not Rarikashi as I am today, but I become somebody else. And uh, if you can think of uh, art world as a series of concentric circles, you start your journey in the in the edges and then you start moving 
uh, even in, as, as you become more uh, 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 years go by, you more practice. So each of these characters, uh, which I become, uh, which I play to be truth or experiments with truth, uh, they all situated in different uh, uh, points there. In one book, I become uh, an artist who has just finished his uh, course but not able to feed himself. So he goes to a, a, a restaurant, eats, and he can't pay, so he's made to uh, watch the results. In another book, I become a very successful artist, and in, uh, in, a, in a show, somebody calls me a bad artist, and I punch him and I'm arrested. In another uh, uh, book, I become uh, somebody who wants to paint, but I don't know how to enter the art field. So I meet one of the local artists, Karnike Swarma, one day, and then he says, You come to me, I will teach you. Till then, I'm a security man in a, in a jewelry shop. So, like this, each book, I become somebody else other than who I am. The idea is that at some point of time, my biography gets mixed up, and then I am not remembered in the same way as I am trying to uh, control it uh, for me in coming. I think uh, when I studied training in dance, I am a classical dancer, a Modini Atam dancer. And uh, after coming from a discipline of design, doing, then when I came into dance, actually, dance opened a complete worldview of design to me. It kind of made me realize that I knew nothing about design. We were not taught anything about iconography, about color, about thought in a certain way that it manifested in Indian aesthetics. And being from India, we did not study Indian design at all. So it, it has actually changed my whole design practice. It has uh, brought in a lot of influence of uh, just form. If you look at sculpture, if you look at Indian painting, if you look at ritualistic arts, if you look at the iconography that is there, I'm deeply inspired by that. And that worldview, world would have not been open to me if I was not in dance at all. I had no idea about it. So it's kind of changed my design in a way. And if you look at dance in itself, it's multi-layered. There is poetry, there is music, and then comes the movement. So when you study dance, you first engage with literature, you engage with poetry. That is then set to music, and then you kind of engage. So in the dance discipline itself, a multi-layered artistic connection emerges very intuitively for any dancer. And sometimes just study, studying sculpture, like for a dancer, the best compliment someone you can get is that, oh, you were as still as a sculpture. So you look at the sculpture and you see that, can I bring the stillness? Can I bring the strength of the stone? Can I bring the voice? And on the other hand, as like very often when I've spoken to architects, they say that, you know, we look at dance, that we want to bring movement, we want to bring agility in our stillness. So there is always a going in and out of another discipline. And for me, I feel that if I was probably just engaging with one of them, my artistic experience would have been much duller than what it is right now. Thanks, Smithy. Anybody else want to just like add to that? or? So, um, to me, I mean, I'm a sum total of all the artistic work, work that has happened in the world. I mean, I don't think I have any original idea, I have no original voice. You know, I mean, I keep learning all the time. I mean, I travel to learn. You look at the world to learn, you look at the works that people have created from the world to learn. And you look at art and artifacts to learn from them. Because you want to say something, but you're constantly searching for the right. So it's when I finished my second novel, both of them were autobiographical. I started looking at, okay, let me look for a subject on which I want to write. And I thought, what is it that, at that point, this is 2013 or so, what is it that really, what is the gap I'm seeing in the world? I, I asked myself. And I realized that our formative years, at least those of us who are in our mid 40s. Our formative years were very rich in literature from the middle of the previous century, which was quite clear about where the 
sentiment of the artist or the writer or you know it lay and it was against a certain kind of system that was at that time spreading around the world i'm talking about mid uh, the the, age, the modern age in literature actually and a lot of experimentation starts happening in literature around the 1950s 60s around the world and i realized that they gave me direction they shaped me as a person but right now i felt that at least in the literary world the seer quality of literature had vanished you know the poet is a seer he can see the future and he guides you to go like that whether you follow or you take a different direction is your choice but there was a seer quality of literature which was there very much in the world but which is now almost absent at least in literature it is completely absent and i started looking at other arts to see what is going on here and this discipline of the artist sort of i started chasing that idea but to look at it in terms of a story in terms of a novel in terms of sculpture sarai memory it led me to start looking at material at clay and my friend cynthia susan who is a potter she like i went to her for her firings and she said actually it's just what we do with clay the temperature at which we we heat it it changes from earthware to stoneware to uh, porcelain to bone china so the material is the same but how do we use it that is the most critical thing and i started meeting because it was sculpture i started meeting ravi and ravi i quit i had i coined a phrase today for ravi he is a curator of extraordinary everydayness <laughs> you know his work is he can demystify art to you like and i i attended his sessions with children where he talks about art and it is such an eye opener if john berger is known for ways of seeing ravi is known for ways of placing you know and it's it's brilliant i actually wrote out a little bit of something he even uses words as objects which was like very offensive for me but i actually saw that he can use them and he uses them brilliantly you know sketches notes drafts and then repair work commission work when it comes back for repair that is like you know the patience that we need to do with it yeah and then he creates art which is tangible which you can feel sense and that i felt was really a huge quality and the focus is always with what i ended my previous session was witness with with the eye with looking at the world differently thank you really thank you thanks aman um maybe yeah sure sure thank you aman uh because i studied uh, in kannada medium school till seventh standard most of my reading uh, happened by long time in kannada and then uh, this idea of witness the idea of world view came to me through shivaram karan dalat murthy kada tejas vi so uh, one of the, the uh, line that they do is that even though they have a, a concept or an idea it comes through uh, the story they don't they don't make it so apparent it comes as a sutra the suggested meaning not a verbal verbose kind of thing so uh, that kind of practice i try to think in my mind even though i'm touching upon my time issues of my time but it should come as an artwork and then succeed through it otherwise it becomes something else not art so that kind of idea has come to me through the kind of little people who still i read and most of the reading happens in kannada and the uh, yeah, the connection is very strong uh, so what i will say those qualities are acquired by reading and i like this idea of cross pollination it is not that you don't become like an island uh, but you you know uh, like a porous thing you keep uh, let allow uh, others to you know your ideas to you get other things coming to you and then transform it so i like that process and that happens through engaging with other uh, people thanks ami actually that takes me to the to the second part of the session that i really wanted to talk about is many of us uh, feel that 
As much as these kind of interactions, communication used to happen earlier, probably today, less and less artists actually look at work even within their same disciplines. I have personally found very few theatre makers who actually go and watch other people's work, um, very few writers who actually read other people's work, and uh, very few musicians who go to listen to different kinds of music. Let leave alone actually allowing this cross-pollination that you are talking about, where you have to take the next step and go beyond uh, your own discipline. Now, this is something that one talks about, whether in reality people may say yes, no to it. But I, I was just wondering if the panel could think a little bit about if A, if you agree with, with this, that there is less of that today. Now, and second part of it is, why do we think that is? Of course, there are there could be external issues in terms of lack of time, we're doing too much, our lives have got busier, the city is got busier, it's more difficult to get from one place to another, but then one could always say that one thought technology and the net and everything else could actually improve communication. But has it? Has it made us more into silos of very separated, segregated practice and we don't actually have those? common platforms, common spaces, where uh, very openly one could debate, discuss, um, or even critique each other's work. And that culture of being able to do so. Could there also be more internal um, challenges and vulnerabilities that come in when looking at this kind of cross-pollination that Aman and Doug spoke about? Um, are there insecurities? Are there vulnerabilities? Are there... Um, you know, sort of lack of curiosity within ourselves as much as we had earlier, less of it today. Uh, just to just to think about it and share with us what you feel coming from your own practice. Anybody on that? Yeah. So I don't know about cross pollination, but I mean, um, at least when we screen films, we have a large audience, and there's a great hunger for uh, for coming and watching films in the theatre. Uh, but also by filmmakers, I mean, by all kinds of people uh, who come and, yeah, I mean, uh, we all try and uh, see as many films as possible, but they're not also available. Yeah. It's, uh, and also the spaces are not available, we don't get access to uh, many spaces. Uh, but, but during the three years that we did have access to one space, uh, we had a large audience, and, yeah. and, and, and I wish at least the filmmakers from Bangalore, many of them did come yeah. often enough. So, uh, so, yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know. With what period you're comparing it to mm. when you say that um, uh, we become less curious? I, I don't agree with that. I'm not sure yeah. how. Uh, no, this is also things picked up from many of the senior artists to say that, you know, during our time there was a sense of camaraderie, there was much more conversation than what is happening now. So I'm just throwing it out for, for a discussion and provocation, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it hard to agree with that immediately. I mean, I suppose it yeah. might vary from art from the art form. Sure, also sure. It might, yeah. uh, I don't know which particular period you're thinking mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. comparing the present mm -hmm. to. Uh, to me, it seems that the availability of uh, uh, of uh, different arts and, mm -hmm. um, to a larger number of people, uh, I, I think many people are actually um, watching them. And more interested yeah, in I think, I think so. Okay. Um, I had an experience a few years ago where I, um, I I emailed this particular musician that I wanted to play with and I said, hey, I, I, I like your stuff. Would you be out like when you're in Bangalore next? Can we get together? He said, oh, do you have any of your stuff up online? Like maybe I can take a listen. And at that point, I didn't because I was in whatever that situation that I had not yet gotten all that organized. Um, and it made me realize one thing that uh, that this is actually this, this the online world uh, is a very different world, but it's also really powerful. I mean, for what I do, which is music, uh, you can easily collaborate online in ways that are more powerful in many ways than what they used to be. So people don't like. I don't know. These I still love to do it, but nobody else seems to want to jam anymore. Uh, but online, you know, the process of exchanging tracks of I build something, I send it over to somebody, he adds something, I and mean, that's how music is made in the studio anyway. It's perfectly sort of uh, adaptable to the internet world. Um, I think it is also a kind of sociological change that has kind of evolved, you know, where lives are more outward and there is uh, less stillness and pause. And even in artistic spaces, I wouldn't generalize, but largely, 
everyone is wanting to manifest and achieve and you know it's like a certain outward engagement and which if you pierce more into that you're just not going to have the time to just halt and pause and and I think these kind of artistic conversations or dialogues that we are kind of looking at that oh are they missing those can only happen when there is space so I feel it's more a sociological thing where there is no space that artists generally are not giving that space and because of which probably it doesn't happen. So I'm not saying it doesn't happen at all, but it's lesser. Like with dancers, I shouldn't say that, but dancers are not interested in other dancers at all. So this sociological phenomenon maybe that you're talking about is not just for the arts, I'm assuming. I'm assuming you're also be commenting on a general sense of people. Yes, it's society. How, it's society yeah. and which has kind of pierced very deeply, I think, into the artistic space. That it's, uh, yeah, and the entertainment industry also kind of taking up a lot of mind space in our lives has, I think, affected all art forms in different, different ways. Thanks. Yeah, I, would like to respond one, one, yeah. I think what you are talking about is the coffee house culture of Calcutta, which is sort of not happening these days. You do market every month. I've never managed to reach there except when it was for my own talk. <laughs> like, so, so no, I was reading Vasudev's book, Riksha, and yeah. I was seeing the number of, like, it's a long thing of when he talks about the different meetings he's had in different places with authors, with musicians, with different. So, yes, the coffee house is like, it stands out as a very iconic thing, but it was happening all over. Yeah. I remember in the late 90s, Prakash and I used to like really fight in Koshis or other bars around. And then the bar would close and they would like keep like, okay, you keep fighting, sitting inside. And then we like, we were pushed out and then you go to the road and you fight with each other. And you know, it went on and that has really, really made use. Partly, I mean, I try to do some kind of a small salon thing at home, thinking that maybe some people should get together for something. You know? But I mean, why? The question is why? It is, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a double-edged assault on us, our sensibility. You know, there is nothing that matches going and seeing a painting in person or listening to a live performance or a And this 2D world, which is project, project, presenting itself as a 3D world of Facebook or social media, where you feel you have got the information, you have consumed it. But you have not felt it actually, it has not percolated through your consciousness. Even all the debates, all the talks, all the arguments that happen there, they are just so, so limited because they have no tone. And tone to me is so important when you are speaking. Right? And we are, we are losing the sensibility without really realizing what is happening. It's only those words and we get angry at them, we get happy with them. We are missing the expression behind them. That I think is a... I mean, whether we can physically meet or not, but to lose expression, to lose tonality of arguments, to lose sarcasm and humor, quotes, you know, that I think is chilling. I mean, to me. Actually, I tend to agree with, uh, with what she said because there's a paradox here. I mean, I, I don't know what was it was in the past, and you know, like Gautam said, what was the reference point it says, no? In the explosion of cultural production is, is incredible. But the thing is, I think from five days of uh, of a video uh, uploaded on uh, on YouTube or every every hour or every minute kind of thing. You know, this year and last year, there's a big crisis. For instance, in Canada cinema, that six releases are happening every week. There are very few theatres that show Kannada films because in Kannada we screen uh, films of six other languages. So it's, it's extremely difficult. There is too much happening. The government uh, endorses culture. Now look at the quality of endorsements you get. You get endorsement of the market, word of mouth. Because somebody says this film is good, many people go and watch this film. And somebody may say, hopefully this plays good, and they won't watch it. And they do. Theatre does happen, I'm not saying. But when it comes to curatorial practice, to get somebody who can curate um, the work of an artist, contextualize it, place it in a way 
uh, you know, to look at it in such a way that it provokes a conversation or dialogue. Now, that, that is extremely difficult to come by for all the media production that is happening. The other problem I tell you is this. There is so much building work that happens. Architecture is there. Architecture should have been a place of experience, a cultural expression of a time, of a people. Okay? What did you do in the past? You gave it to people with power, you validized the demands. They made this and they made that. Did they check with anybody to do that? Is another question. Did I check with a, with a code to bring a responsible people? I'm not making a value judgment on that. But to, today, when you say, when the commissioner says, well, I commission paintings, there are two questions which are contradictory to me. Well, should only artists be allowed to decide on art? Is the survey not capable of deciding or not? Why can't an aesthetic say this is a good, good work? What is the critic's role in this? So when there's a commission work, when they do series play, you know, the likes of uh, Deepavali, or Durga, or Amba, I mean, Bangalore has 82 villages inside Bangalore, and they're doing these festivals, and they have this extraordinary series, like with the design and all that. Why is that not street art? Now, supposing they were autonomous and they were not commissioned, could they produce great work? No, we don't know. I'm saying we need a curatorial, critical culture that is not so special as it is now, but more widespread perhaps. And maybe some of you are doing that role, and maybe it's not enough. But that is the crisis, I think. I think, yeah, it is social, and it is like, it's easier not to talk to each other sometimes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll throw in one more thing here before uh, I do the same thing. Like, some people may feel that um, the education system, if we talk about sociology, we're talking about some of the practical issues about the internet and how fast lights have become, the influx of information and the tremendous rate, but also the kind of education. So for the past, some decades, education has focused more and more on specialization of a certain kind, and the generalist really is out. I mean, look at medicine, it's very difficult to find a good physician. You will find all kinds of other specialists, probably, but it's really difficult anymore to get the family physician that used to be there once. Similarly, in most of our, our work, specialization has been giving down, and it's becoming lesser and, at a lesser and lesser age that you have to choose. Uh, could that be one of the reasons why uh, a general quest and curiosity about a larger world that I may be a musician, but I also need to be, or that I may be a filmmaker, but I also uh, have questions about what some artist is painting. I may be a dancer, but I would also like to know what films are being made now, what are filmmakers thinking about. Could that be one reason why our questioning of world of ideas as a more comprehensive world rather than these various windows through which we are seeing that um, could be just a, again a question thrown in as you as you think of responding to it just quickly respond to that with uh, Alison and then come to this uh, I might take a contra view saying that to it is like when the seniors meet they say our batch was a good batch. After that, <laughs> it's possible, it's possible that each generation is finding its own way of connecting. And few decades down the line, you know, okay, this is how it happened. It may be happening at a different. Yeah, so that is one thing. And the second thing is it's slightly decentralized also. Not everybody can come to one place. So in each area, you find to, you try to find some like minded people and come. Um, so that is one thing. So education, of course, has become. Like an arrow, you know, it goes straight and then hit the point. So, no deflection, no failure, everything is planned to retire and... Also, no getting lost anywhere. Not getting yeah. lost, huh. no. So, maybe that whole pattern has to be questioned. Uh, so, that, that kind of... Uh, see, it's all about giving the right answer. And the right answer is decided by somebody. One answer. One answer, yeah. That's so, the problem. What is that one? I, look, I'm sorry, I'm taking time, but I must tell you people this. You know, when they were building the Bangalore International Airport, you know, they had all kinds of people who were, who were making the decision to build it. And when it was built, 
some people in the Karnataka Legislative Assembly decided that it didn't represent Karnataka. So the, the Germans were completely aghast. They said, why should it, it should look like an airport? Why should it be a <laughs> And then, there were some people who were thinking it should look like a Hoysala temple. <laughs> and they were really like bewildered. And we are, I was invited. I'm very lucky I get to all these places and within the circle of all these legislative subcommittee that decided how the airport should be built. Now I think it's a very beautiful airport. Okay, now the things you can disagree with me, but I think it is. And I can give my reasons when we have time. But the thing is, they were saying it should be built like a temple. So look at uh, this place and that place around inside any, any other airport. They were saying. And I said, but why should it be done like that? What is the point of building it so differently now? Now the problem is, I don't think the public had a single comment to make on that. I remember only one big quarrel that happened. Should it be named after Tipu Sultan <laughs> or Kepe Gowda or Sarin Vishweshwaraya? This was a, there was nothing about the airport and its functionality. And you know, I, my heart went out to the, to the German designers who did that and they, were, they really didn't understand it. I, 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 won't, I swear to you, I didn't understand either. Why should it look like a Hoysala temple? You know, some people can legitimately say it's bad enough that the Hoysala temple looks like that. <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, it's the same company that has built the Bangalore airport and the Hyderabad airport and the Delhi airport and I think uh, no. several other airports. No. no. But uh, certainly Hyderabad, GMR. No, they took over, but they didn't build this. Okay. Okay, they took out the management. So it's, I mean, there is also uniformity to to that. Uh, I mean, I, I, I agree with you that it should. Uh... But we, we can disagree. I think it's a very good airport. <laughs> yeah, but if we, if we come back to the issues that we have uh, with, I mean, whether we agree or not, whether there are issues and whether some of those issues can be addressed on how, on whether artistic connections could be built, are there spaces? What What is it that you feel might help that? Is it re-looking at our education systems? Is it providing more spaces? What else? Huh? And respond, Prakash. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> this ownership of endorsing that this is a good play, that this is good music, that this is a good film, should be critically examined and questioned. All these certifying authorities must be questioned. This is wrong. On, on what basis, how do you arrive at these decisions? I am the authority. This is one of the things that prevents frightens people from coming to say painting or sculpture exhibitions. Because you're saying your response is not enough. You should know a little bit about this. I think that's a bit crazy. Should encourage but, people. But that's not, the problem. that's not the problem that artists will have, right? I mean, since no, we are talking about artists looking at each other's work, that wouldn't be a problem that artists would have or would they? I don't know. It's for the artist answer. But from the theatre community, I will say that if you say some play is good, I think the theatre community will go and watch other plays. Yeah. You know, they may bitch about it and all that, but they will watch. And when they meet for a party, they don't fight. Okay? They just drink and sing and all that. And say, it is possible to do this, to, to, to do these artistic connections that Raman is talking about. It is possible. But I think we need a culture where all opinion is valid at some point of time at least. Then I think it will work. It will open up conversations, I think. Um, just a small point. Every artist whom I have loved and who I have been able to meet, and when I have met them and asked them, you know, like something about their practice, they have always asked me back, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about this painting of mine? How do you feel about it? I think we need to develop that confidence in people that they can feel something, you know, they might not like it, they can say it also. This is not good, this play was bad, I mean, that movie sucked. You know, like, I mean, I'm amazed today on, like, say, on Facebook, people will go and see a bad movie pay 800 bucks to PVR to see it, and then come and trash the movie on Facebook. I mean, don't go and see that movie, you know, if it is bad. Mm -hmm. But somehow, I think we are just so colonized, beholden, whatever, you know, in our heads that we, 
we have stopped just feeling, just responding to art. And if we just respond to, and what is art really? I mean, if we just respond to life, we are fine. I think that confidence has to come in right from the beginning to children, where, as Ravi was saying, we are not formatted. This is right and that is wrong. If you do right, then you go and get a career. If you do I am too forever lost in this world here. I am not done too badly for myself. And it's fine to be lost. We need to give children that sense. There is something that can be a collaboration with the educational institutes where artists, where the, where the, where the students can get to engage with artists who are thinking, who are working. So you are talking about not arts, um, artists being educated to become artists, not that. You are saying general education, if artists can come in there. No, I'm looking at art schools and art schools. Art schools, right. like, you know, right. because even if there's, there's a whole lack of inquiry that is there in our schools, whether it's design, or critical and thinking, critical or thinking, and also looking beyond your own discipline. Yeah. So if uh, one is studying fine art, if you you don't know anything about any art form, you don't know anything about philosophy, and it's also just kind of igniting an interest, I think just in life, yeah. you know, and yeah. just an awareness, and things like this, very often I feel are not happening in institutions. Mm -hmm. And maybe an artistic body can facilitate that when they collaborate with the institution and create platforms where the students can kind of engage with artists and artists can engage with artists. But it's also about the new crop of uh, young blood who is going to become the future artists if they can be initiated. So you guys have basic power talk. Right. Like, yeah. Okay. If there's hunger, so we can learn hmm. it happen, but education can be done. Very better because the Bangalore uh, scale hmm. it, has, it, it happens in several places, not in like specific one. neighborhoods yeah. and closer communities. Yeah. Yeah. In each area, there are artists, there are writers, there are kids, yeah. people. Maybe just bring them there. But like you said, that if it happens organically, but where does it start? Like, yeah, where does the idea start from? The, the presentation can be done, but it cannot be suitable for some. Uh, uh, all right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Okay, then maybe we can open it out. This is sort of a Gautam, even yeah. though he's not a feature filmmaker. But since uh, I know he's got links to some star, and so many of the people here uh, have participated in that, you know, there was an artist who was our director a writer who became an actor, a dancer who acted. Was that era of uh, what brilliant amateurism behind us? I mean, and, uh, so I, I don't know about, uh, whether that will happen in the future, so I guess it's become... Uh, no, I, I think it still does. You know, people who start out, or some of the most refreshing new films that you see, um, Maybe they look amateurish, but uh, there is a certain refreshing quality to them. And I'm not trying to think of which one. So, for instance, Hyderabad Blues, which had something new and different about it. It, it was uh, not a good, I, I wouldn't watch it again, but still, there was something new about it. And uh, let me see, what, what can I think of right now? But in, you know, in documentary films, we don't have that many people working on the film, so I don't know if it's possible to, but it's always. Uh, a non, uh, I mean, I guess one would never think of oneself as a specialist or as a professional. I mean, anybody who comes together to make a documentary film at least does so more uh, because they're interested in uh, uh, and are passionate about it rather than uh, because there's a system in place that isn't. Um, so I, I couldn't really say about feature films, I'm not sure. But I think with the availability of the, these digital cameras, a lot more people are making at least short films. Um, uh, and short fiction films uh, in a setup that is not one where they are looking at their careers or uh, there's a system in place where they, you know, um, at least I think so. Thanks, Kalpan. Any other question? Hi, Basanti here. And want to just, uh, you know, take Prakash's idea about the Villages within the city, the 82 villages that you mentioned, and the um, you know, Grama Devate kind of culture, it's such a fabulous idea. I don't know which among the organizations in Bangalore can actually do that. And I also want to pick on, and, uh, on Ravi's, uh, I mean, pick up that particular idea on orchestra. 
I mean, I have, I have my grandmother's house in Malleshwaram and I have never seen a Yakshagam in Malleshwaram at all. You mentioned that as a growing up uh, influence and I'm so sad that it doesn't happen anymore. But to, to say that this orchestra is, is almost not there, at least I didn't observe it till this Ganesha Hapa this time. But uh, just, uh, Arunati, to take your idea further, which of the organizations can actually prove that across the city, whether it's the village festival, the Anama thing in, in uh, Majestic, I have seen. And you're right, Prakash, it's just, I think uh, people don't even know that this happens. How probably we can use uh, an intersection of technology and social media, if at all any other organization leads that and we kind of socialize and popularize it across the city. I mean, just want to take a thought further if panelists have any more idea of those because that will really involve the actual Bangalore public and I don't even see much happening across the Canada speaking platforms of our local art. I thought the point of the different arts was that you're are expanding your minds, you're like getting creative and that, that chaos is important. Why do all of you want one organization to get you together? I mean, I know there's a vast there, there's a one chunky road, and I've known friends who in their own little community do little things which connect them with uh, actual reality plus with other people who are interested. That's something maybe the sort of thing that Ravi does, I don't know. But the whole point of the different arts I thought was that you're free. You don't want to be organized. Anybody <laughs> 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 want to respond to that? Yeah, Ravi. Uh, when you were in Malaysia, many of us friends, we made this group called Saichaya. And then Gandhi Sai Sangha was given to us free. We had to just book the day. And then we used to call it with the artists. So we had a lot of interaction. We brought out the magazine, which recently stopped after 25 years. So that became uh, you know, a channel for the energy that many of us had. And after some time, it also uh, paid to them. It is possible that it will be a permanent thing. It can just drop up. Yeah, it will feel a certain need when it goes through it. But it came because of not an external agency, but we were all interested, so we made our own. Yeah. But the presentation of the Gandhi Sai Sangha gave the space. And many artists gave it. No, I still uh, suggest uh, that, you know, uh, if possible, Arunrathi takes it seriously. Because, <laughs> see, I come from, I'm the managing trustee of Suchitra, you know, I'm on my way out at the moment. But, you know, we have done, we do theatre, we do film screenings, we do documentary screenings. Tomorrow we are going to screen, uh, uh, you know, Human Harvest, which is about uh, Falun Gong in China. We are going to screen, we have a discussion. The Amnesty Chief in India is going to come and talk there. We do everything. We are a small organization, we do. But it will be almost impossible to get, say, Arundhati to come to Suchitra. We are really far flung. We need one event, once a year, not to organize ourselves, just to meet each other over drinks, have conversations perhaps. That is all I suggested. And by subscription, nobody is invited. If you feel like you should come, that's all I'm saying. Uh, to the audience, also, thank you very much. But before we end, Vasudev, you wanted to say a few words. I've not come here to speak. I was uh, listening to all these people. It's so nice that uh, they could spare their time and come for a discussion like this. And uh, it, it is really very fascinating. And uh, we have tried ourselves a little bit in, in, in bringing people to various activities like the uh, you know, Art Park, Anandadrishya, where Ravi is also part of Anandadrishya program, where, where you know, we, we invite an artist every month. And uh, he speaks about the work, and it's, it's an open thing, anybody can walk in and be there to discuss. And then we have this Heart Park event every month, first Sunday of every month, for 25, 30 artists, we all assemble. People can come there. Prakash has come as a, one of the chief guests there for the program. And uh, 
You know, these are, sir, we have tried, and in fact, in the last few months, we have been asking a poet to come and decide the poetry, and we want to have also a musician and a dancer to come here and talk about what they are trying to do. These sort of things are, you know, it's possible for us to do things like that. And um, anyway, uh, it's a good suggestion, it has come from Arunati, and um, I hope uh, we'll, we'll do much better than that. And uh, thanks to all the panelists, Niti, Prakash, Deep, Anand, Vare, and Gautam. And thanks to everybody a lot.